This isn't to say Ethereum killers, which I also think is a stupid bloody term. Like our economic activity, TVL, all of this stuff combined from everything, Bitcoin, Ethereum, every network, Solana, you name it, is a tiny, minuscule drop in the ocean of the financial world. If you think this is the cap of a global free access financial solution, then it's absolutely insane. This episode is brought to you by Das London, Blockworks number one institutional crypto conference where all the top institutions and people in crypto are going to be this March in London, what's becoming maybe the crypto hub of the world. I have a link in the show notes where you can learn more and also a discount code that will get you 20% off. So click the link, find out more, and I'll see you there. What's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Lightspeed. Today, we are joined by Andre Kronje, who's the founder of Yearn Finance, also the co-founder of Phantom, the founder of the Keeper Network, and he's a major contributor to a lot of DeFi projects, probably one of the most prolific founders, developers in the space. So, Andre, welcome to the show. Thanks. Um, that's a much heftier introduction than I think I deserve. Um, I'm a dude that likes to write some code. Um, that's not true at all. I was listening actually to your Uncommon Core episodes from 2020 and they were talking about you being a builder and you're like, I'm really not a developer at all. I'm just an integrator. But uh, I think you're downplaying yourself a little bit. So you have an absolutely fascinating story um, and so many insights we can take away from that. So maybe we can start back in 2017, 18, when I think you first came into the space mm -hmm. during the ICO era. So it'd be great to hear what brought you into the space. And then also for people that just weren't there, can you explain how absolutely insane that era was? Yeah, I mean, so I, before I got into crypto, I was a very standard crypto skeptic. Um, I, I come from a traditional finance background. Um, I was a architect and CTO at a small local fintech bank branch. Um, we did high throughput stuff that back then we did with Kafka and Scala. Um, so, you know, that, that was my background in like these kinds of high throughput financial solutions. And out of that, that 2017 era, very similar actually to now in a lot of ways in that there was so much noise, you know, there were so many teams that had claimed they had solved these industry wide problems that sort of traditional finance and traditional distribution the systems um, had struggled with for decades. And you've got these, these 18 to 20 year old guys that no work experience, launching an ICO, raising 20, 40, whatever, how many millions, claiming they solved, you know, distributed systems or, or, or whatever the claim was. Um, so I originally came in just just to test my skepticism to make sure am i missing something maybe um because you know it's not the first time that a disruptive tech was created that that displaced the previous technology it has happened um my my worry with the blockchain space was just there was not a lot of you know research evidence. There was not a lot of substantiated proof. There were a lot of claims. Um, so I got into the space, started reading white papers. Um, and the white papers, again, made claims. And on paper, a lot of the claims seem plausible. But now another thing, and this is happening today as well, actually, is that there are a lot of claims that sound really good. That you're like, oh, that makes sense. Okay, yeah, sure. Then, but actually, when you build it and in practice, there are hard constraints that don't allow that to work in the way you expected it to work, even though the theory was sound. Well, no, even though the concept was sound, the theory wasn't. Um, so, having read a lot of these white papers, I started looking at a lot of code, um, and I started doing my original was code reviews. Um, so I wasn't I wasn't doing these code reviews from any like value creation perspective or as any kind of due diligence. This was literally just like, I read this white paper, it said it solved X. And then I go look at the code and I'm like, did it solve X? And more more of like a diary to myself, I just documented it. So, you know, as I'm going through it on Medium, I'm just writing, okay, well, this code doesn't match what they say here. This repo has nothing to do with their claim. And I, I, I made those public for whatever reason. 
Um, and they became very popular during that ICO time because there was there wasn't a lot of naysayers. There weren't a lot of hey, this isn't going to work, and your code proves that you don't have what you're saying you have. Um, the problem is though that, and, and a big reason why I stopped doing the code reviews eventually is that people started taking them as investment signals and not as any kind of, you know, code base. Um, cause I had shared them for other people to learn and go on sort of my same learning journey that I was trying to go through. Um, so anyway, did my own public ones and then eventually got involved with a company called Crypto Briefing with, um, Han Kao and John and those guys, still fantastic. I still talk to them to, till today. Um, started doing the re reviews for them a bit, but, but then it also became a lot more, uh, a, a shift there that I didn't like is it is I liked reviewing public code. So, you know, if it's, it's on a GitHub, I can go look at it. Everyone can look at it. So people can also fact check what I'm saying or, you know, tell me if there's something wrong. Um, but as that sort of influence grew, a lot more of these teams wanted us to review their private code and then like publish reviews on that. And that didn't sit well on me because again, that then, I mean, that's purely an investor signal. There's nothing else there. Um, but anyway, so that's, that's a, that's a parallel. We can go into that if we don't, but, but having gone through this, you know, 99.9% .9 of it was garbage, but there was a 1% real value that was sitting there. Um, and the, the noise ratio was obviously ridiculously high, but, but that, that 1% is the thing that like kept gnawing at me and kept intriguing me. Um, and I mean, looking at back then, so, so, so then my focus kind of shifted from trying to understand what's going on and catching up to kind of where the industry was. And I think I managed to do that in about two years time, I think around 2019, uh, maybe a little bit earlier, maybe late 2018. I think I managed to catch up and it's hard to catch up in this space. I mean, there's so much new stuff coming out every day that you have to like go through the amount of real stuff coming out every day is tiny. It's one to 2%, but you still need to read the other 98 published stuff to actually know what's what. Um, so at that time I had started like, like proof of work back then was, was kind of like the ov obvious bottleneck, like looking at blockchain systems, you were like, okay, so this thing is, is literally throttling the amount, the speed it can go through by, you know, back then Bitcoin was standard. So 10 to 30 minutes, depending on your longest chain rule that you want to take. Um, and, and the, the one thing where, you know, back then this was before DeFi, before AMMs, any of the stuff where it really stuck with me was for cross border payments, cross border settlements, instant online payments. Um, and you know, I'm, I'm, I'm South African now, South African isn't even on Swift or IBAN or any of the stuff. Like we have exchange control for money in money out. We have limitations on how much you can spend online. So like we, we have a very restrictive banking system and it has always been a fight and a challenge. So seeing this sort of free of a single singular entity being able to dictate what's going on was really appealing to me and the background that I came from. Um, so started heavily focusing on consensus research. Um, and during that time, there was sort of the intersection of this research I was doing slash the code reviews I was doing that had started to introduce me to Phantom and the team there and getting a little bit more involved. Um, and they had, they had raised in the hypermania phase. So they managed to raise like $40 million in ETH, which by the way, they kept in ETH all through the bear. I think they only like finally divested when it was like 300 or something. So anyway, um, but, but they had raised on commitments that, you know, again, it's, it's those theories that sound nice, but in practice don't work. Um, and they had, they had kind of realized this and instead of going for the exit scam and, you know, just spending the money and then getting whatever. Um, they ended up asking me if they can use the research that I had started publishing then and had been, you know, contemplating launching my own chain. Um, and it matched, you know, because I, I, I had no experience with interacting with VCs or raising money or capital or any of that stuff. And, and it's, it's not, it is a skill set, and it's not one that I have. So, and you know, that's the same reason Yearn Keeper, any, anything I've ever launched never had 
you know, VCs or investments or these things. And a lot of people think it's some kind of um, ethos slash statement slash I'm making. It's not. I just suck at it. So I figured out ways how to circumvent it. That's really all it is. Um, but so ended up, you know, they, they had funding, they had a team, they had a brand. So ended up then pushing my research underneath there. And the first thing was consensus. Um, and, and, and the original consensus, the, the ABFT, which they call Lacassus, um, but it's really just, it's based off of a paper from the late, early 1990s, um, common concurrent knowledge, which is, it's just any ABFT peer to peer based communication system. Um, and when we originally launched that, and that was late, what was that? That was late 2019. Um, no, early 2020. I don't know. I'll have to go double check. Um, the, the consensus itself was great. You know, it was one of the, the first ABFT solutions out there. It, it, it jumped, you know, from at that time you were looking at max seven TPS and this, this is before we connected a VM, by the way. Um, we were just doing raw transfer connections because it was just a pure payments network. Um, and we could pure payments easily hit between 30 to 50,000, dependent on validator connectivity or participation in the network. Um, and, but we wanted to allow a VM because smart contracts are powerful. And at the time we chose EVM it was the only really viable option. We had explored going with WASM. We had explored going, um, risk-based compilers, these kinds of things. But back then, and even now, you know, getting, you, you need a lot of service providers on top of you before a blockchain really becomes viable for like adaptive to even use. Um, and it was a real struggle to get people to do anything with the base chain because everyone was just like, well, we're just doing EVM and people are just forking EVM. So we're just going to stick with EVM. Um, and then we connected our consensus as a base layer because consensus is just an ordering system. That's all it really is. Um, so it doesn't, you know, it takes transactions, it orders it, and then those transactions get given to the VM and executed into the state. Um, and then we noticed our throughput drop to like max, max, max 200, between 180 to 200. And, and that is a pure limitation of the EVM. And then like the next three years, we spent purely trying to improve the EVM. And like we've, we've gotten far, but I have to say, if I can go back and change that decision, I definitely would. Um, I, I think we chose at the time the easy way out to, to go the route of the EVM so that we know it was easier to integrate with all of these, um, third party vendors and stuff. And, you know, that was an active choice because we, we didn't have the capacity to build our own wallet, to build our own RPC providers, our own, you know, Insta deploy nodes, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but anyway, that's that's also a topic we can delve into a little bit later. So, but then, so so on an earlier topic, so they had raised 40M. They had left it all in ETH. Um, by the time that they finally switched it to USD, there was about two and a half mil left, just a little bit about that. And, and that had to be our entire runway. Um, so in an effort to manage that money, I had started looking at a lot of these lending protocols that were there at the time, um, Compound, BZX, Fulcrum back then, um, another one I don't remember, other than Compound, none of them are still alive. Um, and, and on a daily basis, I would go look, and remember this was back when fees on Ethereum was like three to six cents. So you could do stuff every day. Um, so every single morning I used to go and check each of these sites and check where is the highest API being offered. And then I would move it between these protocols manually. Um, and then as time progressed, I was like, okay, it's getting annoying to check each one of these. Surely they have smart contracts on chain that I can go look at what the interest rates is, collect it all for myself and then display it. Um, and, and the original reason why I wrote my first smart contract that I deployed on, on Ethereum, that was purely an, an, an aggregator of the APYs. That's all it did. It fetched it from all of these different places and then displayed it there. And the reason I did it was because I couldn't figure out the RPC infrastructure and like Web3, JS, and any of that stuff at the time to be able to pull that from a node and actually execute it. So it was easier for me to just deploy it on chain and then read from there. So, so I had, I, I had now started my foray into sort of solidity development with that. And, um, so now I had this thing that at least in the morning I could just go check it, see which one was the highest and then move it. 
Um, and then I started to realize, okay, but hey, I can actually just write a smart contract to do this for me. Um, and that was Yearn. You know, that was the original thing. I mean, later, obviously, it got a lot more smart. And where it's at now is is rocket science in comparison to what I coded. Um, and But, you know, that was the premise. That was I wanted a... In each step that I was doing manually, I just tried to automate until it got to a point where, where, where it was doing that for the funds I was managing. Um, and the reason I actually made it open, um, so that other people could also use the same system, uh, was so that I don't have to every morning go and click the button to rebalance it between the different protocols. Because every single time someone else interacts with it, whether it's a deposit or withdrawal, it does the rebalancing. Um, so it ended up automating the whole process so that I didn't even need to worry about it. Um, and that's, that's honestly how Yearn started. But then as Yearn started growing and, uh, the, the token launch, um, which again did not go as planned, the token launch wasn't some kind of, um, what did they call it? Fair launch or any of that stuff. I was literally, I was literally making a satire. I was making a joke on, these worthless tokens like when i wrote they're worthless like it it was that's not a meme i meant this is nothing like i'm going to give the shit away for free if you put liquidity here it, it in my mind seemed like the dumbest thing possible and yet obviously i was 100 percent wrong on that one um but so that attracted a lot of attention people started getting on board things started getting a lot more complex in terms of strategy and start of infrastructure and all of these things and then what we spent as strategies got involved and there were like harvesting, harvesting that needed to happen, which is just dumping the token of whatever protocol they're busy vampire feeding. Um, this again became something that, you know, I was doing manually running a script that's doing this, et cetera. So I was like, look, there has to be a way to, to, to do this in a public space where anyone can call it and they're incentivized to call it. Uh, that's where jobs and keepers came about, which eventually evolved into keeper network, um, which again, you know, it, it was working well for yearn. So we were just like, let's just open this for anyone to be able to connect a job. And then there are keepers. Like I have no idea where these keepers are, but they do this work. Um, the very first job I did that way was actually so fascinating to see because like we, we hadn't advertised it. We hadn't published anything. Um, we had just activated this job and there were just bots started calling it. Um, and it was hectic to, to, to see these things happening on chain, you know, and that's why it used to be called the dark forest. Now, I guess it's just the MEV forest. Quick break to tell you about an upcoming event I promise you don't want to miss. It's BlockWorks' biggest and best institutional conference called DAS London. It's a two-day event happening in London this March where we're going to have over 700 institutions, 130 speakers, and a couple thousand of us all under one roof. Crypto is in a position for the first time to actually onboard these institutions, and they're showing up. We have companies from BlackRock to Visa launching real products in the space. We have the real-world asset narrative taking off. We have things like payments that have been exponentially growing. And then we have things like Deepin happening in the Solana ecosystem. There's a ton of capital right now in this institutional space. It's going to be coming on chain. It's going to completely change the industry. Whether you are an institution or you're a retail user, or you just want to learn more about what's going on in the space, this conference is for you. You're going to be able to meet some of the best and smartest people in the space. The speaker lineup is absolutely incredible and you'll get to hang out with me. But the best part is you actually get 20% off your ticket if you use Lightspeed 20 when checking out. That's Lightspeed 20. I put a link in the show notes. Um, I recommend buying this today because one, you'll forget about it. Two, these ticket prices go up every single month. So anyways, I hope to see you there. Now, let's get back to the show. You know, then... Then a lot of, for the lack of a better word, fuck ups. Um, I mean, eminence. Um, so, so, you know, before, before Yearn, I had, I had, there people, there were people in the space aware of me, but I did not have the kind of public renown slash notoriety, whatever you want to call it, or, or, or eyes on me rather. Um, so I had, I had developed a lot of bad development practices. Um, the so-called test and prod, you know, which I did do. And, and, and again, here, another example of how intention and alignment is completely disassociated because, because test and prod was my there be dragons statement. That was like, Hey, I'm a guy that's testing and prod. This is not what you're supposed to do. If you interact with this stuff, chances of something going wrong is incredibly high. I'm making the statement to, to warn you. That if you interact here, you need to understand that there, there is extreme risk. 
Um, and test and prod ended up becoming some YOLO kind of just throw money at stuff statement that was seemingly embraced, which again, not the intent, but that's what it ended up being. Um, so anyway, so I had, I was still using my old development practices and I was still building out eminence and eminence, you know, I was, I was very upset at the time with NFT culture. I think it's improved since then, but at the time people were, were using it for the dumbest shit. You know, they'd, they'd make a drawing and paint, make it an NFT, sell it for a hundred K. Um, and, and I wanted, I, I always loved the idea of NFTs because I'm a, I'm an avid gamer and like, I, I have had regrets in the past over, you know, you put in so much energy, time, commitment to farm a cool item or to, to, to get a certain title or something. And all of these things are NFTs. They are the perfect use case for NFTs. There's a lot of other ones as well, you know, deeds, titles, blah, 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 authenticity. But, but that's the one that I was excited about. Um, so I, I had gotten eminence and a IP license for that, which was from another game company to build that out in just some stupid, like, you know, almost flash based games, but just to show to people how that stuff should work. Cause, cause the other problem is, and I think this is always going to be a problem with NFT IP is, is you, it, it can't just be in one game. You know, the value comes when I can transfer it to another one, but studio B isn't necessarily going to use Studio A's items and stuff because, you know, they have their own game, their own ideas, their own theory. So the whole plan was to build these bunch of different sort of games that all use that same base layer. Um, but anyway, deployed a bunch of tests. People interacted with it. Big exploits lost like $16 million. Um, I, I took a big step back from the space at that time, um, realizing how incredibly dangerous it actually is. And how quickly something can go wrong without the right safeguards, et cetera. Um, also at that time, due to yearn, I was facing quite a bit of pressure from quite a few regulatory agencies as well, um, who were qualifying it as a financial instrument, which I guess is fair. Um, but so I also just wanted to distance myself a little bit from there. Um, I ended up coming back with solidly because one thing that I was stuck with for a long time was how to improve AMM curves. Um, and at the time, you know, there was, there was just one de facto standard stable swap curve, and that was Curve Finance um, by Mitch, absolute genius of a developer um, and founder, architect, everything. Probably, I still think, one of the smartest guys I know in this space. Um, but I was obsessed with it. You know, I wanted to make something that was Uniswap level simplicity, you know, X, Y, K. Um, so I ended up, you know, with the whole X to the power of three Y plus Y to the power of three X, which worked great. You could define that curve. It was simplistic. Um, part of that also added a, a bunch of, um, at the time you had TWAP, which, you know, time weighted price. And I added, um, RWAP, which is reserve weighted price. Cause one thing about like how, how these X, Y pools work is there's, there's, Actually, I don't even need to explain that. All you need to know is like with, with TWAP, it's a, it's a fixed price point in time. It, it completely ignores the amount of liquidity. So it is saying, Hey, you can sell a billion of this thing at this price fixed. And that was a big problem to me because like a lot of the liquidation bots, liquidation engines, lending, um, even, even like fully decentralized stable coins, all of these things needed to understand to slippage into a part of that calculation, you know, because if, if I want to, if I have a bot that needs to go check, Hey, uh, and let's use a liquidation bot because it's simple to use and it needs to go check. Can I repay this guy's debt, get his million ETH collateral, and then go sell that in a Uniswap pool and still make profit. Now, if I use TWAP, I'm going to, my bot's going to say, yeah, profit, good, go for it. But if I actually sell that thing, there's going to be so much slippage, I'm going to be wrecked. So what I needed was something that gives me that liquidity in its calculation as well, so that I can check, you know, realistically, and, and it, it's time weighted specifically so that, you know, right now there isn't a flash loan that puts in a lot of liquidity and I think I can sell, but meanwhile, that's just front running my bot, um, so that I can go back in time and check, you know, was everything there and then built out that. Um, launch that in Phantom, obviously also massive fuck up there because like a week or two later, stepped away from it. Um, but you know, that's with, with, with the exception of Phantom, 
And I, I always felt that that is what decentralized protocol founders are supposed to do. If, if your protocol is completely immutable, there's nothing you can update, there's nothing you can change. And if you designed it that way from the start and you deployed it, you need to walk away because you, you can't be the figurehead attached to that thing. And, you know, I think Yearn and Keeper have done well with that because they had people that come in and sort of manage it in a very decentralized fashion. Um, cause I mean, I don't think for either of those protocols, you can really say who the like Andre was, if I can say that. And, and solidly, even though it was definitely a fuck up on Phantom, you know, I mean, it's gone on to be like a primary AMM on a lot of like fresh VM change. Um, Velodrome, Aerodrome, I don't know. There's a bunch of them. Um, they, 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 they account for massive amounts on TVL and all of these L2s. Um, so, you know, again, like it, it went on to accomplish kind of what I wanted, but, but not the iteration I did. Um, so after that decided, okay, look, my, my, my DAP days are done. My smart contract days are done. I am not equipped for that. I don't have the necessary infrastructure for it. So just went back focusing Phantom full time. And sorry, that was an incredibly long sort of history. I, I apologize, but I've, I've been here for a while. <laughs> yeah, that is. That's quite the story. And um, I like how nonchalantly you, you spoke about very major events and <laughs> like crucial <laughs> to the industry. So that was that was good. Um, but wow, yeah, there's a lot uh, we can talk about there, but maybe Phantom. I want to talk about Phantom. Okay. Um, you. No, you don't. You want to talk about Solana, but you're being courteous. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, 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 I actually do want to talk about Phantom so we can see what we can steal from there. Uh, ah, some, some that smart I support. Tech. I, 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 I think the, the, the DB can definitely be useful. The VM, I think the SVM is the gold standard currently. Um, I, I don't think there is a better VM currently out there. I think the data structure definitely is because, because the, the, the Carmen, the new database, you know, we, 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 we went through the usual process. We started on, what was it originally? I think it was Badger. And then we did a lot of research into these different DBs and we switched to Pebble and we got a nice throughput increase, but nothing major. Um, and the, the, the problem with all of these, these off the shelf databases is, you know, they're designed for off the shelf data. They're designed so that anyone can kind of store anything in any way they want. Um, and, and with that, you know, if you have structured query language, SQL on top of that, it means a bunch of stuff is happening on the background. You know, they're building up their own indexes. They're building up their own like B trees and things. Um, and all of that adds a lot more overhead than people realize. So like even, even when you switch to a key index store, you're like, okay, this makes more sense for EVM or VM based data or, or let's rather say like smart contract X data. Um, and then you think that's going to be a throughput and, and true it is, but again, there's so much lifting happening in the background to support their query language, you know, GraphQL, SQL, whatever it may be, um, that, that we were actually quite shocked at the amount of throughput that was increased by switching from one of these standard database structures originally to Pebble, then to a key value store. And just currently it's just a, a flat file on disk. There's nothing bloody fancy, and and our our lookup pattern is so simplistic, right? Because like any any smart contract is is an address, so that's the first part of your index, and the rest is just on which address slot is the piece of data stored that you're looking for. So that's literally just one, two, three, four, five, six. So if I'm looking for, let's say, the first one is is the smart contract's name, it's literally address one. I I have it. Like I don't need anything more. I don't need some fancy language. Um, and that actually now, now to be fair, that unlocks EVM restrictions because, you know, the EVM with its, with its MPT data structure on top of sort of all of the existing index building and things you have is extremely data intensive, you know, cause I mean, you, you have your actual data structure leaves and then you have the. The, the compound of that and the compound of that and the compound of that and 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 until you finally get to your 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 top leaf um so so there's so much heavy lifting that needs to be done in that data structure and and most of that is hashing which also incredibly intensive every time you need to do a read and a write i mean our our vm if we just look at carmen so just that data store right it it increased 
at peak capacity 8.2 fold. So 820% more of throughput just because of that. And there's a lot of other stuff we also did that also does incremental changes, but you know, that that in itself I think is a big one. And and what one thing I have been preaching for a while is I think I think a lot of blockchains, a lot of development teams have have kind of accepted the limitations of today as 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 you know as as physical limitations as like this is the limits that this can go according to the rules of physics and like i mean really uh, is, is that where we're capped i mean if you ask the bitcoin guys proof of work is the fastest consensus like mm. anyway sorry i'm interrupting i'll yeah. shut up <laughs> no no that's it's actually perfectly aligned with how Solana thinks about the state of the world as well. Like if you look at Kevin Bowers, who's the lead for Fire Dancer, Solana's new client, it's all about making the software as efficient as possible. Because to your point, there's a lot of weird abstractions causing a lot of weird performance issues. And then those compound and compound. I mean, they've even done things like speed up hashing algorithms. And I think to your point, like there's certainly a lot of gains to be made by vertically scaling first and optimizing the software to leverage physics to its fullest before adding all this complexity. And, and you know, I'm not going to, that, that I'll, I'll go on a rant about that. But um, I think, um, so what I want to do actually is for people who are unfamiliar with Phantom, um, you know, we have a lot of developers, investors, researchers, whatever, maybe more familiar with Solana and, and like, you know, Ethereum itself. Can you just briefly explain exactly how phantom works at a high level what makes it different um and what are some like obvious things to look for well the 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 very first thing that we focused on was consensus you know this was at the time of proof of work being the dominant system um and 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 maybe just just this is this is more of a parallel but you know like i it's a pet peeve of mine when people say that a blockchain like phantom is proof of stake Proof of stake is an anti-Sybil mechanism. It's not a consensus mechanism versus proof of work is a combination of a consensus and an anti-Sybil mechanism. This concept of common concurrent knowledge, as the, as the three words say, common knowledge and sort of concurrent knowledge. So, so as an explainer, I, um, uh, I don't know. I'm looking for a stupid example now. Um, I, I, I have in, I have in earphones, right? Now, now, Mert, I tell you, I have earphones in. So, so, and I give you proof that I have earphones in. So now you know that I have earphones in and I know I have earphones in. Now, the other thing that you do, you then go to Garrett and you tell him, Hey, Andre has earphones in. And Andre told me he has earphones in. Now, Mert, you know that I know and you know and Garrett know. Garrett now knows that he knows, you know, and I know. Now, I don't know Garrett knows, but two thirds have reached consensus and have agreed that this event is known by all of these network participants. So, so, so that's Phantom's consensus, right? So, because what we wanted to do is either way, all of these validators in a network are communicating with each other. You know, they're sending pings, they're checking, are you still alive? They're, they're sending transactions that they know about that the other one doesn't know about because they always try and keep their mempools in sync. So, so there is constant communication happening. And we were looking for, okay, but how can we leverage this, this communication, this actual P2P layer to reach consensus? And the way to do that is to share the message, but also share a little bit of knowledge of the message, you know, share, Here's the message. Here's everyone that knows about the message. And, and here's a signature that proves that they know. Because then as, as everyone just keeps sharing these messages via normal. So like Phantom doesn't actually produce blocks. Um, it's, it's a pure DAG. You know, as, as a message gets on, eventually enough nodes know about it. And then there's a chain on that. We, we actually then, for the sake of the EVM, we then actually take what, what we call epochs. Now, now an epoch is when, when two thirds of the network, know that two thirds know. Now it sounds a little bit stupid, but you know, that just, that just means that you, you've reached like a super majority, if I can call it that. Um, and then that, which is an epoch, we actually then transform into a block and give that to the EVM because the EVM is a little bit dumb. It doesn't really know how to understand complex structures. So you have to simplify it for it. Um, but technically we don't even have blocks, you know, so, so literally just as communication is happening, consensus is constantly being reached. Now, this does mean that we are very, very, very um, dependent 
on the topological communication network. So, you know, we we have actually identified quite a few areas in that P2P layer, again, where we can make very significant improvements, which is now our next focus um, after um, Carmen and Tosca. Um, but but that was consensus, right? And And that purely... Just that communication, even, I mean, in today's day and age, you know, like, like latency is not a big thing. I mean, even if you're talking across the world, you're talking 200 milliseconds. Um, you're not talking, you know, high things. So the amount of time it takes, especially if you use broadcast protocols, which means it's not one to one communication, but I'm sending it out to everyone I know about constantly. It does mean there's a little bit of overhead on the amount of messages being processed like that, but you can very quickly share information in a network like that. You can think of it sort of as those as those old virus spreading maps, you know, like how quickly it starts slow from one to two, but then, you know, exponential growth just means it propagates the network so much faster. So so as as that communication protocols improves, it just means these things go faster and faster and faster. There, there is a little bit of a drop off as network participants increase, but you know, it's not linearly connected. It's closer to something like log in. So there, there is, but there's a point where it just scales out and then you don't even really notice the, the drop anymore with more participants. Um, so that was the consensus layer. And then, like I said, originally back then we were just doing transfers, you know, just FDM, my wallet, your wallet, nothing fancy. There was no VM. There was none of that stuff. Um, and then, uh, like I said, dependent on that topographical network, um, 30 to 50. I mean, back then we had a lot less validators as well. So, you know, take that statement with a pinch of salt, please. Um, I mean, it was probably 50 validators back then. So, uh, it's, it's, it's a lot easier to optimize for those kinds of numbers. Um, so then... Then, like I said, we wanted to switch in the VM. And the original plan was our own ground-up VM. Um, time was getting a little bit restrictive. Um, and so we made some time-based decisions, like I said, which I do regret. Um, ended up decoupling the VM pure from just GIF. Um, and like I said, just rewriting our consensus. So it just orders into these blocks and then gives these blocks to the VM and the VM can just process an update state because that's all it needs to do. So it's actually, you can, you can think of it as two separate components. Um, and then throughput dropped drastically, you know, even, even in our like optimized situations where we're getting 50K in the, in the raw transaction network, we're doing, we're doing 160, 180 if we're lucky. Uh, the max we ever got it to was 200 and that was, that was on one node. Because we wanted to test, hey, what is the real upper limit here? I mean, you you don't get. Obviously, we could have scaled that more with hardware and things like faster disks. So you know, don't take that as a as a hard line number. But that's what we got back in the day. Um, and then our our research focus shifted a lot into the VM space. And at the time for our for our consensus stuff, we were actually getting some peer reviews and a lot of assistance from the University of Sydney at the time. Um, and we started developing a very good relationships with Professor Bernard Schultz, um, who uh, he's he's amazing. Seriously, like I, you, you, I, I'm, I'm, I'm sure you guys. Do. So some people just make you feel like an idiot. Like, like they don't do it intentionally. They're not trying to be mean. They're they're just on such a bloody different level that you know, like it's 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 annoying frustrating sometimes but uh, a wonderful learning opportunity and i've learned so much um and i mean he he's literally like one of the forefathers in programming languages and vms and stuff um and he came in with a bunch of fantastic ideas and brought in a whole team um and and i mean carmen tosca that's that's his babies like like i i know enough to keep up with what they're doing but I do not have a claim to those things so so anyway so let me quickly explain tosca is the new vm um, so we, for the time being, because we, we do have DAP developers, we do have an ecosystem and we do want to take them into consideration. So, you know, there, there was two options really. There's sort of the clean slate option where, look, all of these developers who've already been building on you and the community you've built and the support you've built and all of this stuff, you kind of have to say, eh, you guys need to rewrite everything. Um, or we need to kind of find a middle ground where we can sort of accommodate them. Because let's face it, when we say you guys need to rewrite everything, bye. Um, from their side, not our side, where we'll help, but they'll, you know. 
Um, so, so we kept we kept bytecode level compatibility. So, just quickly for 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 people who don't know, there's this top level languages. This is in the EVM space stuff like Solidity and Viper, and they get compiled to bytecode, and that bytecode is what sits in an address and something, and that bytecode is what is executed and executes opcodes and actually you know trans transmutes the state. So so we wanted to keep bytecode compatibility so that if we did a fork from the network, that everything that was previously deployed was still compatible. Um, that is currently a still ongoing internal discussion. I am in the camp of, I, I think, let's, let's cut the technical debt. At, at some point, you need to make that call, right? And like the 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 EVM has got some hard limits that you cannot circumvent without a a complete redesign. Um, but anyway, so for the time being, Tosca the VM is bytecode compatible with the EVM. So you know you don't have to you don't have to go recompile your Solidity contracts and stuff if we do do a migrate. But you are welcome to obviously. Um, there are some optimizations you will gain if you do recompile because we do have a new interpreter from the high level language like Solidity and Viper. Um, and then one of the things that currently isn't actually active, but one of the things we needed to move to, to this new system, um, it's, it's, it's silly examples, right? But like, um, uh, EVM uses eight bit opcodes. We use 16 bit opcodes and like, you wouldn't think that really makes much of a difference, but running running from transaction one to fifty million on on an eight bit interpreter takes about forty hours, purely in memory, no disk. Running on a sixteen bit interpreter does twenty seven hours. I mean, that's that's like a thirty percent change in performance already because of that. Now, obviously, there's a lot of other stuff happening, but 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 that's one of the parts. So so a bunch of like just just I want to say. Not new research, things that, you know, VM guys have known about for decades. And, and this is one thing that happens a lot in our space that always drives me absolutely insane, is there's so much existing research on distributed systems, on VMs, on this kind of architecture, all of this stuff. And for some reason, most people just always ignore it. They're just like, fuck it, I'm going to learn how to do this myself. I don't need to follow the research of these 20,000 people that have spent the last 40 decades dedicated to this. But anyway, so, so a lot of it is just applying, you know, well existing proven technology that have improved basic things. Um, but another reason we switched to the 16 bit is so that we can use super set instructions. Now, now a little bit on opcodes. Well, well, actually, I, I can explain this a little bit easier. So, so, so a basic math thing. Like, let's say you've got A plus B multiplied by C. Um, now, in in the traditional EVM, you would have to go. You you take one slot for A, and then you'd have A plus, and then B, and then that's one operation you did. And then you take the output of that, and then times C. Apologies for people that know mathematical operands. I know it's not supposed to go that way, but just bear with me here. Um, so a superset instruction is is where the where we analyze common patterns. So we see, hey, A plus B plus C happens a ton. Like that is 90% of what is happening in this network. So instead of it being two separate operations, why don't we make a super operation, a super set? So you're combining the two, that there is now instead of A plus B, there's a default plus multiplied by. And again, that, you know, normally you'd have to go to the destination, you'd read, you'd modify, you'd write for the one operation, and then you do that for the second operation. Now you halve that amount you need to do by introducing the superset instruction. And 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 especially VM currently, if you look at DeFi and you look at e NFTs and any of this stuff, I mean, an, an ERC transfer, right, is is standard, but it is a combination of about a bunch of things. It first reads your balance. Do you have enough? Then it does a check against that balance. Then it does a subtraction against the balance. Then it updates the balance of the counterparty. Then it checks that the balances are still the same after the effect, and then it commits it. But I mean, that you can imagine how many times that happens on chain, and that is a bunch of different opcodes running that could be one super instruction. Um, so, so, but now, now again, this isn't new things. You know, this is existing research of decades old that we are just applying 
because it, it wasn't applied to the space for whatever reason. Um, so, so that's sort of on the, on the VM side. We, we, we also, we spent a lot of time looking at parallel execution at parallelizing it because like, again, that's, 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 that's another example of like one of those things that seems very intuitive. Um, because I mean, like if I'm sending USDC to Garrett, then Mert buying an NFT shouldn't need to wait on me sending before his can get committed to the same state, you know, um, the most interaction that happens in blocks are often very, very connected though. You know, there's this MEV stuff happening, um, before and after transactions often in periods of high activity, that is a lot of activity to the same state. Um, so, so, so after running quite a lot of like optimized case parallelizing, um, there is an increase, there is an increase in what we call our, our clair clairvoyance example, which, which clairvoyance, by the way, is we, we took all of our transactions from one to 50 million blocks and then all of the transactions in there. And then we, we, we first did the sort of a brute force mechanism and that was slower where you just chuck them all, didn't work, okay, try and reorder them. So after that, we sort of ran some some optimized sorting algorithms to find the best way to write the state, to see this is our optimum clairvoyance. You know, we know exactly what the answer is supposed to be, and we executed it that way. Um, and we got a 30% improvement, which which is good. But, you know, there's so many other places where we're gaining 800%, 400% that like that, that one went to the bottom of the barrel and researching. And then the, the next big one that we got into after the VM started speeding up a little bit, the, so, so, so one of the things we developed, um, um, substrate, which, which is our, um, it's our live fake environment. It allows us to make small changes and then run the whole system very quickly. In, in sort of snapshot that, no, not snapshot, in containerized views where we can see what is the change that this one thing would have made. Because, you know, otherwise it's also very difficult to test what is the impact of these things. And you don't want to spend six months of building to then find an answer. And then you're like, oh, that doesn't actually work. Oops. Um, which we have done a few times in the past. But that was actually the first tool we, we built. Um, and we do actually want to open source it because it is compatible with any EVM network. So, you know, it is useful for our um, blockchain development houses out there as well to be able to to replicate in that, um, and and that was the tool we've been using to sort of test all of these different theories and incremental changes by making small changes to the code base and then running it through quick. Um, you know, normally it'll take you a few days to to run through a large data set. This can do it in a few hours. And part of that is our profiler, and that profiler shows us okay, but where is most of our time being spent when we are actually executing these transactions and stuff? And after we had introduced a bunch of sort of VM level improvements like these, like these opcodes, like supersets, all of these things. Um, we also do, do, do hotspot caching, for example, which is where if state gets hit a lot, we just keep that in cache. And then you just always hit the cache instead of needing to go for the reads again, basic, right? Like, I mean, that's, that's been web development even 50 years ago. Um, but again, for some reason just doesn't happen. Um, and then we also do, we also do SHA hashing, caching, for example, um, so that we don't have to recompute that the whole time because that's quite intensive. And a lot of the hashes are just like state roots and things. So it's happening the whole bloody time as these things are being validated. Um, but we saw our next biggest bottleneck is disk and that is database. And we tracked it down to all of those reads and writes. And a lot of that is things happening behind the scene that you don't even realize, like I said earlier, index buildings and these kinds of things. And then we went through that evolution of first Badger, which I think was standard with, with Geth and then Pebble and then eventually Key Value Store and then Carmen, which we have now, um, which, which, you know, it's just two things really. It's, it's the new schema sets, um, which I'm trying to simplify. We can go more in if you guys want, by the way, but I'm trying to keep it high level. So that's the, the address plus address space, and then that is the value that you're looking for, because that is really how basic smart contract data lookups are. Um, and then the other thing that it supports is just live pruning, but this is more specific to Phantom. So so Phantom, because of the ABFT system, it doesn't actually need a longest chain rule. Um, once you have that two thirds of two thirds known, then you can truncate everything that happened before that, because you only care about state. Obviously you can still keep it for archive purposes and these so kinds of the things. Same. Yeah. The, 
with the proof of history. But but like you you, you don't need there's there's no longest chain. You you have true finality, um, which is something I've been fighting a lot over as well. Because you know like I I know this is doom speak, but you know let's say proper quantum computing secret lab somewhere in i don't know insert random evil country um they develop it like they manage to do cryptographic hashing in less than a second they can create a new bitcoin not really ethereum anymore now that it moved but they can create a new bitcoin longest chain submit that and be like hey here this is the new one we own everything now thank you um so you know they're there are risks to having probabilistic finality, which is the assumption that by now it, there are so many blocks that so much work is required that it can't really be changed um, versus true finality, which you know e even something like Bitcoin can technically do. They can have like, okay, at this point, all validators sign that we agree that this is our new state and then going forward, you know, it's only that part that can be missed like that. Um, but the possibility does exist, although that's doom speak. It's not realistic in the next 50 years, probably. Um, so anyway, live pruning just allows you to keep the disk low because the state bloat is a massive problem in any longest chain system, you know, like, like, you, uh, and it's, it's one of those problems where you want to solve it before it becomes a problem because when if your blockchain does get a lot of economic activity traction whatever it is your state is going to grow so quick that your validators are going to start suffering they're going to have to upgrade they're going to have to improve so so the 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 state area was always a big one for us to look at in any case but with the with the live pruning and and even without the live pruning just you know the reduction in sort of the flat storage and that that address index lookup we use uh, that decreased our so if we take Opera blocks one till now in, Opera is our current running chain, Sonic is the new one. And we process all of those transactions just as is through Sonic, its its storage on disk is 98% less than what it is on Opera just because of those changes. Because now you don't have all those background indexes and lookups and everything else that comes with a database. Um, and again, that's big because as as the activity increases, hardware needs to increase so you have to constantly be fighting that that battle between increased specs lower requirements increased spec lower requirements and and it's it's a constant you you can't avoid it you know it's 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 the same in in web 2 or just you know traditional finance worlds eventually you have to scale up those things but then it becomes really expensive to run those things so you have to find new ways to change the code and you repeat that about every 6 months in the traditional world in any case um, so anyway, Carmen, new data store, about eight times throughput. So that we saw is the big bottlenecks there. Our, our new two biggest bottlenecks is the P2P layer and the, the transaction mempool. Those are now our two biggest bottlenecks. So those are the two we are currently tackling next. It's sort of standard optimization engineering. You know, there's, there's nothing new here. This is very traditional stuff where, where you take your stack. You, you profile it, you see where's your biggest bottlenecks, you focus on those, run it through the profiler again, cool, next one, repeat, ad infinitum, until you're making such small optimizations that you feel like you want to kill yourself. I, I am, uh, you, you said something very interesting that I want to quickly touch on and use as an opportunistic segue. Uh, you, you said one of the reasons you didn't do parallelization was like, because most of the stuff in, in a blockchain is connected. And um, what's interesting about that is um, that's actually like the opposite approach that Sui takes or like Move, which is like they assume optimistically everything can be done concurrently. And so we don't know how that'll work in practice. But I want to use that as a segue because you're an OG in, in crypto and especially Ethereum. How do you think about the new way that Ethereum has approached scaling? Ethereum isn't approaching scaling. Ethereum has decided there's too much happening and they're too scared to do anything, so they're just going to leave it for now and not do anything. Which I don't necessarily agree with. You know, like, like I mean, I, I think about this a lot, right? Like, like, like even Phantom, which, which has a lot less economic activity and a lot less financial value, I am terrified every time we do a rollout or an upgrade or change something. E e even with the Sonic thing, we have, we have tested it into the nth degree where where I, I have run out of ways to think about testing. But I'm still so scared deploying that because you know one one mess up 
with an opcode or a bit of bytecode and money gone. Um, now, obviously, I have a bit of PTSD with this thanks to eminence. So, you know, it is, it is terrifying thinking that the smallest thing that you didn't even necessarily think is correlated can cause that kind of financial losses. So, I mean, that's why re respect to them even moving from, from proof of work. You know, I think that was monumentous for Ethereum and all of the participants and, and a huge success, you know, kudos and congrats to them. Um, but I think, and, and, you know, I've, I've, I've seen this with every company I've worked at as well. When you're new, you're R and D, you move quick, you break things, you gain traction, reputation starts becoming important, value becomes important. You're, you're no longer allowed to take the risks that you normally would. Um, so, I mean, Ethereum's thesis at this point, you know, is, is, Hey, we're going to make it other people's problem. And, and that's, that's L2s. I mean, by their definition, um, I mean, people seem to have forgotten that lightning network was the first L2 on Bitcoin and no one really, no one really does much there. But anyway, um, it's, it's, it's probably the right approach that they're taking, but it is the, it is the, we're, we're, we're happy where we're at. We don't need to improve approach. And, you know, historically, not looking at blockchain, looking at traditional companies, that is every single time that a new competitor appeared, was capable of taking those risks and surpassed that previous generation. Um, it's what Ethereum did to Bitcoin. I think it is what the next generation of layer ones are doing to Ethereum. Um, this isn't to say Ethereum killers, which I also think is a stupid bloody term. Like, like our, our economic activity, TVL, all of this stuff combined from everything, Bitcoin, Ethereum, every network, Solana, you name it, is, is, is a, is a tiny minuscule drop in the ocean of the financial world. So if, if you think this is the cap of a global free access financial solution, then uh, there's so much tribalism. It's absolutely insane. Um, and, and anyway, the, the, the reason I'm saying this is, you know, there are going to be times where you, you use Ethereum, where it's, it's not necessarily for a buying a coffee at a Starbucks, you know, it's for, it's for a, investment portfolio for some old bank that only changes their stuff once a year, you know, then perfect. Great. That's max, you know, sort of security based on their security budget, et cetera, which in itself is also a bit of a meme, but, but, you know, let, let, let that be, there's, there's a place for that. You know, it's the same reason. Like if, if you want to, if you want to pay someone in today's day and age, you don't use Bitcoin. Like no one uses that. When I got into the space, my first, salary was in Bitcoin because that was the payment network, you know, like now I can't imagine needing to wait an hour for someone to send me some BTC. I'd rather do it on, um, I'd rather do it on ETH with rap BTC. Andre, I've got a question here that I think ties a lot of this conversation together. It's really a go-to-market question for Phantom, but, but to really discuss that, I want to go back a little bit back to when you were at Curve. So when you were at Curve, you did this fair launch, which essentially the founders didn't take any tokens, and that basically made a cult of personality for you. Someone even wrote an ebook called The Blue Pill that described you, depicted you as almost a god because of this fair launch project. And I know you've talked about this. At one point, you were like, I code and prod. And then this whole cult started generating around you that became really hard to operate because whatever you did was just so highly like scrutinized and looked upon. So anyways, then you abruptly left Yearn, right? And the price relative crashed overnight. Okay. And then a little bit later, you came through with solidly Phantom. Phantom had this run up. I think this is in 2022. And then you left again, right? And at that point, you actually you did a blog and you said, Why I'm living DeFi. And it's like the toxicity of the culture versus the ethos. Um, and a lot of people came after you and saying, like, you rug pulled everybody, even though you were just one person working on this project, right? That you rug pulled us. This is the reason the token dropped 50%, even though you were saying you think in crypto, it's great if the founder creates the project, it's immutable and leaves. But one reason those projects were so successful is not only because you were one of the first people to do it, similar with Yearn, it was the first fault really that you had, you know, this aggregator that you had on Ethereum, um, but you established this reputation that when you went to Phantom, that reputation came with you. And that was a big reason that the project also had so much speculation behind it. My question is, now that you're 
at Phantom, how do you think about go to market? Because all these blockchains are in more or less some way working on this convergence to have the same end game with mm-hmm. some small differences. So how do you think about it now? Because you're no longer really leaning into that, you know, cult of personality to have that speculation and capital come in. How do you think about separating Phantom from the pack when a lot of tech seems to be converging into the same place? Yeah, so I mean I I, I think the first thing and, and I think we've taken the right steps towards this, but but the first thing that we needed to do was to identify who's who is actually our users. You know, is it is it the person with Rabi or MetaMask or whatever wallet ledger you want to use that is interacting with a DAP or is it the DAP developer? Um, and and we quickly realized that it's the DAP developer. That's that's our client. That's our user. That's the person we should be servicing. Um, and then we started looking at, okay, how can we improve the lives of our DAP developers? There's a bunch of little things, right? Like like the just being ABFT, for example, means that when you do a a RPC call for submitting a transaction. By the time you get your 200 OK back, that means that transaction is committed. It's final. It's done. You don't have to sit there in the background and poll, um, you know, is it committed? When is the block? Is there enough blocks? That's that's a lot of extra boilerplate code you as a dev have to write if you're doing the website stuff. Um, small example, lots of stuff like that, um, where we're just trying to improve the coding experience in that general journey. The The next thing we looked at is like most of fees, gas fees, et cetera, is going to validators on security. We can take 20% of that and give it to the DAP devs for the economic activity they are generating. So that, you know, they actually have revenue flows other than a big raise at the start and then slowly just sort of bleed out and die because you don't have another revenue source. Um, and you don't want to charge users because then someone's just going to copy your code and do it for free in any case until eventually that dies. But that's a different story. So so our, our gas incentives were a big program that I think has gone quite successful so far. Um, gas subsidies is another thing, which is like built-in base layer relayers where new users that will come use that person's DAP, they don't need to pay. Um, the, the DAP devs can put a little subsidy that they can fuel from their gas incentives um, that pay for all of that interaction. So it's like a native relayer that, that just means that the, the, the onboarding experience for their users is a little bit easier. Um, and then the other thing, you know, we've, we've focused a lot more on sort of school slash university level programs where we run a hackathon every three months with, um, students. Um, to try and teach them, really. Because we're not expecting them to be the next builders. Um, but in five to 10 years from now, I expect them to be the next builders. And then, you know, it'll be nice if they're familiar with with our stack and our ecosystem and those kinds of things. So so it's it's a much longer term approach. Because one thing we realized is that trying to, trying to fight for mind share in the current environment is pointless. That's a complete waste of time. Because um, in the past, we have actually incubated, seeded um, teams through, you know, their original conceptual phase. And then they normally go on to a series A or a B or whatever. And then they get a lead VC. And now Phantom doesn't have VC backers. It was just a public sale. So, you know, we don't have any of those big name VCs behind us. And then when these guys, when these teams go and they get their lead investor, their lead investor always tells them, oh, no, you're launching on chain ABC. You're not launching on Phantom because that's where they are invested. So can't blame them, but you know, at the same time, it feels a little bit cheated. So we kind of just stopped interacting with, with those kinds of teams and things. Um, and, and I also believe that you know, currently, most of the devs building decentralized apps are just replicating what we see in the traditional world. Nothing wrong with that, but the, the next big decentralized app is going to be with someone that has grown up with decentralized networks. You know, it's not going to be the the thirty year old devs that are now going to cross over and think of something new because we 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 don't have that encoded in our DNA. So we also want to cultivate that sort of new energy. So uh, I mean, this might not be what you know the token holders in the community and whatever want a year, but but I don't think we're going to win that game at all in the next two to four years. And I don't think our tech stack is where it should be yet to enable that. Um, but we're fortunate in terms of our overheads, our runway, that kind of stuff that, you know, we can take a fairly long term approach. And, and that's what we're trying to do. We have a pretty, you know, deep Solana crowd here. I saw you tweet. Somebody asked you about rollups coming to Phantom and you said there's no rollups on the roadmap, but we are doing something with SVM. Is there any uh, alpha or insight you can give to us on that? 
Yeah, well, like I said earlier, I think SVM is the best VM currently. And like I said, our consensus is decoupled from it. So even though we are currently obviously focusing a lot at improving the VM, our goal was always to 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 plug in other VMs, WASM, SVM, etc. Um, because again, just using our consensus mechanism as an ordering system that just outputs to there and processes from there. Um, nothing fancy. I'm sure people would have liked something more exciting than that. Uh, but I, I will say we consider it the, the best in terms of VM technology currently out there, and we are looking to to couple it with our consensus. You know, if you've been following Solano around a little bit, they just had the Jito airdrop. It's more or less a airdrop season of sorts. There haven't been a lot of tokens, and, and now there have been. You've gone through the airdrop process. Um, I know it's interesting, actually, for people that don't know, with Yearn, you airdropped all the tokens at once. This is like so early in the day. This is back in DeFi summer 2020. Um, a year later, the community actually came together and they inflated the tokens by 30% to actually reward contributors and also to go into the treasury, which I think is something now that people know maybe we shouldn't just put all of our tokens out at one time and not do a treasury. But you were so early back in the day. I'm just curious, do you have any tips or learnings and what you think about how these airdrops can be successful? And is that something that you would still do or is it just mercenaries? Um, no, I wouldn't do it nowadays. Um, airdrops have been botted and liquidity farm to the point where there's no real value in it. It's it's like with Keeper, right? With with Keeper, um, those tokens weren't an airdrop. You couldn't farm them. They were they were um, what I called back then OLM options liquidity mining, where you you farm the option. So if if I put in my liquidity or whatever, uh, and I earn ten tokens, I don't actually get the ten tokens. What I get is I get the option to purchase those tokens at a discounted rate. So the ones we did, I think, were like 50% or something. So I can pay 50% of the current market value and then get those tokens. Um, that was the, the, the test we were using at that time. And I think there has been some decent adoption of that, not as much as I think there should. Um, but, you know, some of the best systems I've seen, um, uh, inverse, I think DAO was a good example where, where it was manually done. You know, the first guy was like, Oh, I like you three. You three are going to get some tokens. So now we form a council together. And now the four of us decide who's the next contributors that get. Um, and I think that's one of, uh, one of the best ones, right? Cause like the, 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 the thing about airdrops nowadays, it's, it's mercenary and, and, and it's very hard to circumvent that. And the other thing is people are always going to be unhappy, no matter what. You you are going to have a large segment that are unhappy. So, you know, you might as well, like, if they're going to be unhappy in any case, get get a value exchange there. Don't 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 give it away for free. Um it it's good in that it attracts a lot of eyes and attention. And like for a lot of which which I which I also think is bad, um, for a lot of teams. Their initial ICO, airdrop, fair launch, whatever you want to call it, is their absolute peak. You know, that's max activity, that's max everything. And it's just kind of a slow, silent decay into death from that point. And, and I get it because it's a, it's a, you are competing in a space where if you don't do that, you have to work so much harder. But if you do take the longer term choice and you do decide to do the longer term option, you're not going to have as much hype. You're not going to have as much users. But I can promise you those guys airdropping and ICOing, et cetera, they also don't have that real hype and those real users. It's just there's financial value to be made. So that's why there's a lot of activity. But fast forward a year, they'll probably be lower in usage and value than the, the people that didn't do that and just kind of went to low, slow, tedious, arduous. And it's hard in the space, right? Because like you're competing with with so much lies, bullshit, scams that people think are real and will defend to like their death that you have to fight with, that that taking that long, slow approach is really, really arduous, but but it does pay off better in the long time. You know, it's like a perfect example to me is Solana, where where they could have done the EVM approach, right? Where it's just like, fuck it, we're gonna incorporate EVM into proof of history, done. But that that moment that we integrate that I consider one of one of our biggest mistakes because at that point in time, we 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 did the the quick time trade off. Now now sure that means that people can very quickly come to Phantom and deploy stuff, but that's why you see ninety nine percent of stuff on new chains are forks, right? It's people copy pasting from A to B, and then they do their farm, they do their liquidity, they do their token, then the team leaves, and then everyone else leaves because you can migrate back so easily. 
Versus if you do something new like the SVN, sure, it takes a lot longer to build up users. You have to do a lot more teaching and stuff. But like the guys you have there, you know, they, they can't just quickly bail ship and jump over. And even if they do, they realize, oh shit, it's actually not so nice here. I want to go back. So it, it, it's, it's, Solana is very good proof for me that like taking that longer approach is generally the better one and has the better payoff. But you do have to suffer longer. Mm. That's a really good point. Uh, fun fact for everyone that Phantom is the second oldest EVM chain ever. So after Ethereum, um, obviously now you guys have the, I was calling it the Phantom um, VM that's coming out as well. Um, okay, I promise last question here as we close out. You were on a podcast about, I think this was back in February, and they asked you about, you know, when do you think the next bull market is going to come around? And you were saying how, you know, you really actually appreciate the bear market because it's when you can focus and and build. Uh, but you did say on there that you thought it was going to be the end of the year, uh, which right now prices are going up a lot. I'm just curious, do you feel the same way? Do you think the tides actually turned or are people just so bored that we have this temporary blip? Uh, there's, there's so much at play nowadays that... I don't, the, the world is just shifting so quickly, you know, I mean, like, like COVID, Ukraine, Russia, Israel, Palestine, like there's been so many massive once in a lifetime events, like three this year, um, <laughs> that, that it has become an exceedingly hard to be able to do any kind of real prediction on this kind of stuff. I, I do think there has been a sentiment shift and a sentiment shift normally does coincide with price activity. Um, that sentiment shift now is positive. People are happy again. People are having fun again. And you know, most of the, most of the, it's, it's, uh, I don't know if it was Buffett or Munger or, or who it was that said, you know, you, you have to wait for the tide to go out to see who's not wearing clothes. Um, you know, that has happened. We saw who's not wearing clothes. They ran away or got locked up or whatever. Um, and now, now the people that are still left have gone through the depression phase and whatever. And it's like, you're, you're at the, oh, but it can't get worse. So it has to get better phase. But I, it's, we're, we're, we're there now. And I, I hope, I hope. It's true. It can't get worse. Um, but I mean, there's been so many cataclysmic events these last years that you never know what's around the corner. Um, assuming there isn't a new once in a lifetime event, I, I think it is looking positive. Um, I, I, I don't think the pain is done yet in the traditional finance world. And I don't know how much that is going to bleed over. Um, I think there's a lot more pain there at least for another year or two. Um, I do think it's possible crypto might be decoupled from that. I am, I am optimistically hoping because crypto is more fun. Um, so barring an event, you know, that's, that's cataclysmic. I, 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 I think there is a reason to be a little bit positive. Mm. Yeah. Like you were saying earlier, it's really hard to imagine coming to crypto and then going back to your private equity or investment banking job. I think if anything, you saw people go into AI, which is another frontier. And then now people are probably coming back into crypto as well. So um, it's pretty fascinating. Uh, I'm sure everyone that's listening can tell how smart Andre is and how big of an impact he's on the ecosystem. On top of that, I didn't know this until I was getting ready for this interview. You're a, I think you're a lawyer, or at least you have your law degree. Is that right? Uh, I can't practice. I never did the bar. Um, I did my originally, my, my first thing I studied was law. Um, that was 2001 or something. So definitely, definitely not. Don't, don't, don't trust me when it comes to legal advice. That's for sure. I'm sure there's been benefits though, just as if you've gone throughout crypto, having some of that, um, in your back. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I mean, look, that, that, that was a big driver behind my whole, my whole crypto regulation thing as well, which, which I also got burnt at the stake for, um, which, you know, the, the argument I was always trying to make there, and that's why I differentiated between regulated crypto and crypto regulation is crypto regulation is impossible. You know, we're going to see it with all of these nation states that are like, okay, but you are not allowed to do ETH transfers on XYZ. And it's like, you can't stop that. Like I can run my own node and do it and nothing you can do can really prevent that. But you can provide useful legislation for regulated crypto companies, you know, Circle, Tether, whatever, you know, um, um, Coinbase, 
um, Binance as we are seeing now, you know, that that they can do. And I was a big advocate for that, you know, regulate the things you can regulate, that you should regulate where it's not on chain, it's opaque, we don't necessarily know what's going on, lessons learned from like FTX, Alameda, et cetera, um, three arrows, but acknowledge that you can't really touch crypto. But but nuance is lost in the space, right? Like all people heard is Andre wants to have crypto regulated and pull the ladder up behind him for everyone else. And it's like, that's, that's not, there's nuance here, but you know, it's, it's n- nuance doesn't make for a good headline. No one, no one has time to read more than a single line. You know, it's just mm. that simplistic. Yeah. I think it's a little quixotic to think there will be no regulation at all. And I think a lot of people, you know, they're like, we just want clarity more than anything. That, um, that. But it points, points to L2s, right? Like with base, for example, operated by Coinbase, one sequencer, that, could be regulated and you know maybe in the long run that's actually the word bullish you know comes out because maybe you have more users that are kyc and they can do coinbase credentials and so forth and then you might have something like phantom or solana where it's not kyc or certain applications are because now you can do these hooks where you can you know a transfer only happens if a program runs behind the scenes so i don't know what the future is but like the regulation is definitely going to be part of a lot of crypto no i agree and and i think you know, the, like, like we, we've, we've seen it in Ethereum, right? With like the OFAC sanctions list and like a lot of block producers don't allow transactions to those. I mean, the transactions still go in because other people run block producers that do. Um, but you know, those are like, like, like if, if I'm a validator and I'm running in the US where the OFAC sanction list matters, I need to abide by that because I live under that jurisdiction. It's that simplistic. But if I'm in, I don't know, insert random <laughs> random country, country in nowhere where the list doesn't matter, you know, I can run a validator without it. I'm like, I, I'm not under your jurisdiction. So like, to me, entities should regulate crypto where they can identify, hey, person X is in my jurisdiction doing Y activity, this falls under my jurisdiction. Um, but trying to like globally stop stuff and like then you know, it becomes if devs, like uh, base layer devs that they hold accountable, which can't change the stuff even if they wanted to, because if validators don't adopt it, then they're fucked. And then they try and, you know, lock those guys up, which we've seen in a few cases, right? Um, that's missing the boat. And that's like you, that's why I wanted our industry as a whole to understand that we have to help educate. And if we're just constantly, you know, burning flags and trying to like tell these guys, fuck off. The harder you push back, the they can push really bloody hard and they can make your lives miserable. And, you know, at, at, at one point, there's only so many times you can say, there's nothing I can do until you start lying and say, fine, I'm going to do something. And then you, you know, building back doors or stuff. And, and that's worse. Does that still scare you at all? That, I know you mentioned from being at Yearn with the token launch and everything that, you know, CIA, whoever it might be, would come after you. Is that still in your mind? Uh, yeah. Look, I've, I've, I've had my fair share of discussion with a few three letter agencies, um, which I admit when I first got the letter terrified. But then as the process continued, you kind of learn its discovery and like education and, um, I, I think it actually went well, a lot more positive than I originally had thought. Um, also, you know, back then I found it funny because like everyone on crypto Twitter was like, oh, these guys don't know what's going on. It'll take them years to understand and catch up. And like the questions that these guys were, were asking me were so low level technical that it's like these guys know the space better than most of you on Twitter. <laughs> um, no offense, but that's, that is how my interaction went. Um, I, th- I think overall, honestly, it was actually a little bit more positive than I had originally thought. Still terrifying. Um, but, you know, it can very quickly go another way. Like, like there were a lot of easy fuck-ups I could have made. Like, one of my saving graces was A, not raising. You know, it was just token year everyone goes and, and, and the fair launch. And the other one was walking away when I did. Um, if it wasn't for those two, I, I, I think I would have a lot more problems now. Mm. 
Yeah, well said. That's actually some pushback I've heard on doing, I think you described it as like options, kind of a airdrop style where people, they'll get an option, they can exercise it. And some people are worried that that would actually put the protocol operators, you know, into regulations arms because you're, you're would selling would. something, right? Yeah. Would. Yeah. Well, anyways, Andre, um, thank you for coming on and telling your story. Absolutely fascinating. I've been following your story for a long time. Never thought I'd actually get to talk to you. So this has been really cool. So thank you for coming on. Yeah. Anytime, man. It's a pleasure. Thanks for having me. Yeah. All right. We'll see you next time. All right. I've got a little ending note here. First, thank you so much for listening to the full episode. If you really liked it, hit subscribe. But secondly, make sure you sign up for DAS. This is BlockWorks' biggest institutional conference happening in London in March. I've included a link in the show notes and also a discount code. Get 20% off. Make sure to use Lightspeed20 when you sign up. All right. I'll see you there and I'll see you next time on Lightspeed.